So this good friend of mine is a good musician. And this good friend of mine is under outrageous, an outrageous spirit of infirmity. This person gets hit with all these fancy afflictions. And they have deep and detailed layers of information about these conditions. And it's knowledge, 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 information, information, information. Getting information from the atmosphere of human logic. This friend of mine is afflicted by spirits of infirmity because of being surrounded by nasty antichrist Christianity for many years, raised in nasty antichrist habits, which come out as words and declarations and accusations, accusing other believers of being this and that, Acc accusing the world and its peoples of being all these dark, dangerous, ugly things. And no repetitive declarations of the remarkable gifts. Literally, the supernatural benefits. And there's a few of them. We are strengthened by using the language of humans and spirit beings. Say it, the language of humans and spirit beings. So when you're using that language, you are giving instructions to the helpful spirits. You are giving warnings to the troubling spirits. And you don't even know what you're saying. You're using the language of humans and angels that comes forth from this thing called the gift of the Holy Spirit. But that's kind of weird and uninteresting and we'll kind of shove that off the table. That's a controversial topic and we're not gonna even really deal with it in a day-to-day -day way. We're certainly not going to have the children follow us in our in our joy language. We will just keep everything quiet and we will operate only in human logic and only by the instruction of the experts. Including the so-called pastors. Now, a person who wants to teach about the true visitation of God, Jesus of Nazareth, that's a nice, you know, that's a nice operation, that's a good idea, but in 1 Corinthians, I mean, in, in uh, Acts 14, 21 to 23, we see how a pastor is selected. There's a group of friends that are in a remarkable, closed, private relationship with one another who actually enact the supernatural connection, koinonia, friendship with omnipresent Yeshua, who is in every place at once. They connect with omnipresent Yeshua and they connect with one another while always first sharing the things that the Holy Spirit has given to them since their last meeting and sharing the downsides, the little negative things. You know, the, the, the junk that's happened. The wrong moods, wrong words, wrong decisions that have happened. So, you've got this neighborhood group of friends and they meet in a closed and private meeting with all their kids and everybody together and they actually workshop on all the standard problems of human reality. And in my life, the human beings, the adults around me, were so damned nervous and scared and ashamed 
of talking about the simple realities of the feel good of the body, the nice thing of having a person of your own, and the better thing of walking single like Jesus and doing your best to keep the feel good of the body quiet. That's a real discussion that was never given to me. And then there's the flow of the man and the flow of the one which, which bring forth a baby. Now, you don't want to talk about any of that kind of stuff because that's too mature for the children and this is a problem and da 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 da. Well, if you're supposed to be connected with the supernatural and eternal life, then you sure should be able to speak about temporal, real things in a good way. But, I mean, to each home group, his his own. I mean, you can select your own practices for your own personal group of friends who are looking out for one another. But as I see, nobody has a supernatural group of friends that are looking out for one another, which is what true church is, which is what a tr a ecclesia is. So I have become an expert in the Christianity junk and I'm not really happy about that. I didn't choose to be in this position. I was literally thrown into it by God the friend. Now, I can tell you about the various churchianity atmospheres that I camped out in for long periods of time. If you're interested in knowing something and you wanna ask someone's opinion on a situation, you should go to a person who has loads of observational experience. I have watched the charismatic Pentecostal churches. I have seen miracles, lifelong, lasting healings, amazing stuff, personality disorders and what you would call mental illnesses, which is a myth, the concept of mental illness made up by the industry that makes money by selling petrochemical drugs. Find Really Graceful on YouTube and find Rockefeller. And you will see that the powerful Rockefeller industry literally shut down any kind of normal, simplistic, and natural dealings with human infirmities in order to better benefit the petrochemical drug industry which makes money for the oil companies and that's okay i mean that's just a part of reality but if you don't understand that you are surrounded by a medical atmosphere that specializes in brainwashing for profit, then you're going to be brainwashed by other people who are profiting from you. So now, I wish I could take you on a tour of each of the types of churches that I spent long periods of time in. The Messianic Jewish Church, which in some ways is opposed to the Orthodox sacramental Catholic original church gatherings who carry the liturgy of James and the special honor to the communion meal, which is not given or presented in the Messianic gatherings. But in the Messianic gatherings, you learn all this amazing stuff. And also the social gospel people who don't, don't want to hear about the word of God, the word of God. They just want to see people who are serving other humans because that's what Jesus did social gospel groups. And then there's the plain folks groups that are totally separate, blocking their minds and operations from worldly enterprises and media and stories and songs and et cetera, et cetera. And they were, are living completely separate. And there's many other groups, but the group that I started in is the group that I call super evangelical or information Bible or 
Father, Son, and Holy information. Okay. So if you're an information person, if you are an information person and want to see empirical, clear information, then I warn you, there has been great distortions. Read the writings before that are literally the essence of things before Abraham and the lineage of Moses and the former covenant, the Hebrew scriptures. Read or listen to the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees. These are not canonized scripture, but these describe all of the details that Jesus' parents talked about all of the details of things in the spirit realm that were understood to be true. Listen to Enoch and Jubilees so that you can prepare, be prepared when you read your Bible to be reading with the essence of the writers who wrote this stuff. The Second Temple Judaism people. The first century Jesus, or Jewish people, that became the first disciples of Yeshua. Then, read the two most important writings outside of the canonized New Testament, which is a thing called the Didache, or the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. D-I-D-A-C-H-E. The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. And remember, in Acts 2.42, it says that the first 3,000 people were literally addicted to, obsessed with, constantly devoted to. The word is the word that we get addicted from. They were addicted to the apostles' teaching. Now that is an enormous presentation. The apostles' teaching is a set of absolutely amazing details that the Son of God visitation guy presented to 12 people for everyone. The thrilling news given once for all. So the Apostles' teaching is something that I was never instructed about. So the two most important writings outside of the canonized New Testament saturate in them. Pop them up on your YouTube or on your internet and listen to them over and over again. The Didache or the teaching of the twelve to the Gentiles. The teaching of the twelve apostles to the Gentiles. The Didache. The word is that is what we get didactic from. It means the teaching. It literally means the teaching. So it's the teaching of Christ. And Christ says if you don't hold to my teachings, you're not really my disciples, you're fakers. In 2 John, it says, if you don't bring all the teachings of Christ, you don't have God, you're doing a wicked work, and you shouldn't be influencing people. So if you are confident that you have all the teachings of Christ on and can give that teaching completely to your children, then you're okay. But if you are not confident that you can describe in detail what the apostles' teaching or the teachings of Christ is in a home and family atmosphere, then you need to work on that. So, listen to Jubilees and the Book of Enoch, and then listen to the Didache and Justin Martyr's first apology. All of the church historians, the people that really love God and know their stuff, declare that those are the two most important writings outside of the canonized New Testament because they give you a picture of the day-to-day -day life of the early disciples. Now, what are the things that you can do that basically thumb your nose at the dark side and the dark spirits and the world? What are the things that you can do? You can pray and sing in the spirit and invite your children to come in with you and pray and sing in the Spirit joyfully. That's number one. You can have the closed communion meal 
with people who first cleanse their consciences and say, I did this, I did that. This is a very important thing. And it's the brothers. The women don't have to confess their sins. The children don't have to confess their sins. They confess them to the head of their house. Read Joshua 7 again. When the man sins, his entire family is affected. And the men are challenging one another to purify themselves and be in the way of Christ. So two things that human beings can do at any time or place to strengthen themselves and their constituents and children and women is pray and sing in the Holy Spirit and have a time of communion where we put Jesus supernaturally inside of us, connecting us with him and connecting us with one another as the body of Christ in our little local neighborhood, not in a big assembly hall because you can't clean your conscience there. There's nothing wrong with a big assembly hall for community gathering, for worship, for all different types of teaching and information. But there are many details that the big worship centers have thrown away that were essential parts of the early church. Fabric and the covering of the human head is affecting the demonic and angelic realm and showing God, hi, I am a man, I am more harshly judged. My women have their heads covered in our hottest time of closed gathering, praying and prophesying and speaking forth things of the Holy Spirit. The women have their heads covered because they're saying, hi, we women know that we're less harshly judged because we're called more easily deceived by troubling spirits and we're called weaker. And so we put this gesture of fabric over our heads, reminding God that the veil was torn, the temple era was ended, and we are now the temple as we gather together in communion with Christ, with no visitors and no learners. We are willing to die like Christ did because of his gift to us. So when we come together, the men uncover their heads saying, hi, in the era before this era, all the men had to cover their heads with a prayer shawl to talk to God to show a gesture of humility. But now, when Christ was on the cross doing the most important job, the veil was torn, the fabric, fabric was ripped, and us men are invited straight into the holy place to talk to God bareheaded, bareheaded and wide open and willing to communicate with God. And our women are side by side with us, and every woman using the name and the blood of Yeshua is greater than all of the prophets and all of the kings. You know, your little daughter and your spouse are greater than King David, greater than King David greater than Solomon, greater than John the Baptist, because of the name and the blood of Yeshua. And if you don't understand that this removing the covering from the head and the covering of the head is a silent gesture of obedience to what Messiah taught. Now this is the part of the apostles' teaching. And if you spend time in 1 Corinthians 11, there's a word that's called the traditions. These traditions are not Jewish traditions. They're the traditions that the Messiah, God in human form, gave to human beings. And that is when you come into God's presence in a closed setting, remove the coverings from your head, men, because that way you're saying, hey, my friend tore the veil. There's no more temple. There's no more tabernacle. We are the temple in the tabernacle, and we're sitting and hanging out and talking with God the Father and the Holy Spirit and omnipresent Jesus ourselves in our little gathering places. And that's marvelous. That's the declaration when the man uncovers his head. And the men tell the women, you are greater than John the Baptist. You are greater than King David. You are greater than all the apostles that live because you're alive and you can actually start a brand new generational lineage of peace 
with God. But I'm telling you, the Christianity around you has been teaching darkness, evil, and antichrist behavior just by example. If people who love on you give you an example of how to act, and you like the fact that they love you, and you follow after them, what happens is when I speak out, people say, well, my pastor never talked about this, and he saved many people, and da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, I spent 28 years in research. Did you? Did you observe the problems that were happening in different sects of Christianity? Did you observe what it was like when people obeyed some of these little details of the apostles' teaching, how much cool stuff happened to them? I've watched all this stuff. In the scripture, it says, you don't receive because you don't ask. When I bumped into an amazingly wise man, Father Andrew MacDonald Graham, I spent a lot of time at his house and I would call him constantly to ask him questions. People don't call me to ask me questions and that's okay because it's my writing and my writer's cabin time. And I also have some responsibilities before God for my own personal cleansing and my preparation and even my care for the most important people in my life. You know, if it, you know, Yeshua says, if you don't care for the most important flesh and blood people in your life, your spiritual activity is completely worthless. If you don't care for the ones who, you're, who are your own flesh and blood. And remember, there are parents in the Lord. You have spiritual parents who are completely different from your physical parents. And you need to discern, and it is written, you should obey your parents in Adonai, which means your parents that have come to you, that have taught you the wisdom of God. So take all those things to your heart, and I'm telling you, it has been very difficult to spend time with precious friends, seeing and observing precious friends who have been under, I mean, I'm talking about low-level, stupid, goofy, little demons of infirmity and physical afflictions. Just because of this darn lineage of churchianity that just basically ignores some of the coolest God stuff. It's just so sad to me. It breaks my heart. It makes me want to cry. Because there's a blindness. There's a total blindness. And it's not good. Peace be with you. May you be refreshed and complete in the things of eternity. and the spirit realm, and the spirit beings. There is a spirit that loves you and wants to help you. Right now wants to help you. Not later, not soon, but right now.